to me, Bitcoin has huge potential. I, I do see it as digital gold. Uh, I know that's a meme, but I think it it's I, I believe in that. Like I, I think Bitcoin because of its simplicity, it's hard to change and it has these kind of set rules for how it works and it's not kind of moving or going anywhere. But I think the the new financial system, um, a more open um and programmable financial system, that's going to happen on Ethereum and and not on Bitcoin. Your crypto working for you? It can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros with the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk-reward ratio, but also your assets are protected by our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain players across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Camila Russo, the author of The Infinite Machine and the CEO behind The Defiant, one of the coolest podcasts in the game. We're going to discuss some really exciting topics such as what is DeFi, but also what are the top highlights on The Defiant podcast? And on top of that, a personal story through Argentina's hyperinflation and lots of cool stuff to come. But before we kick off, a big shout out to Nate at Crypto Slate, who happens to be here. <laughs> Don't forget to check out the summarized version of this video if you'd rather have the reading format. It's really well summarized. And without further ado, Camilla, first of all, congratulations on all your great effort and all the great results. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Super excited to have you. And I'd love to kick off, Camilla, by that transition going from Bloomberg to falling in love with this space and dedicating your entire life you know, on educating people on the crypto and blockchain space. Tell us your story. It must be fascinating. Thanks. Um, well, I'm, I'm a financial journalist. Um, I was at Bloomberg for eight years. Um, started there as an intern in New York and then went to uh, Buenos Aires to cover markets there. And it was in, in Argentina, actually, when I first wrote about Bitcoin in 2013, seeing how Argentines were using um, cryptocurrency to protect against inflation and currency controls. Um, then I, I spent some time in Spain covering European stocks and then back in New York in 2017 and 2018, where I was a macro market reporter for Bloomberg's Markets Live blog. Um, and I took this chance to write about crypto again. Uh, as you know, 2017, there was a huge uh, a boom, as as you know, um, and writing about the space every single day, you know, uh, 
covering like all the craziness um, and also just the like revolutionary um, tech and aspect of it. I, I really kind of saw the huge potential it had and 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 just really enjoyed um, covering this like just like fast paced um, crazy uh, space and basically never never left uh, since. Um, at the end of 2017, I decided to uh, pitch to write a book on the history of Ethereum, uh, the Infinite Machine. I got a deal with HarperCollins and then spent most of 2018 between writing the book and uh, still being a journalist at Bloomberg. Um, but by the end of 2018, I decided that I really had to kind of um, focus on finishing my book in the best way I could. And I also decided that eight years at the same company was enough time and I, I was ready to do something different and, and be independent. Um, so I decided to leave Bloomberg in early 2019. Um, so 2019, finished uh, my book um, and also uh, started The Defiant uh, as a newsletter in June. Um, and then it, it kind of grew from there, you know, added uh, a podcast, a YouTube channel, a website to host all this content last year. Um, and this year I'm, yeah, building out e even other uh, pieces uh, to it to make it kind of the information uh, company for Web3. That's super cool, Camila. So what really caught your heart? So was it hyperinflation and Bitcoin? Because later on you wrote, obviously, The Infinite Machine. What really caught your soul and made you think, I'm going all in on this? Yeah, I think the the kind of first thing that, that caught my attention about crypto um, was my experience in Argentina. Well, I'm originally from Chile, so um, you know I'm I'm from uh, South America, uh, but uh, Chile is very different uh, from Argentina. Um, Argentina still has a very um, populist government, um, which basically prints money to finance itself. Um, and this means that it's constantly running into uh, problems with inflation, uh, people wanting to sell their their uh, local currency uh, by dollars. Um, and so the way that they fix this is imposing currency controls, which means making people uh, stay in the local currency and, and forbidding the purchase of USD or a foreign currency, which makes people want to hold pesos even less. Uh, so it's this kind of like vicious uh, cycle. And um, and I was, you know, covering this market, covering the different ways that people were uh, were finding to, to uh, handle this, like how it was impacting uh, the economy, people's savings. And then, you know, I see this um, this currency that is completely independent from any any uh, country, any central bank um, that can be transacted uh, peer to peer without the need of any intermediary or financial institution. Um, and the, I mean, I I just thought that was pretty revolutionary. You know, the the ability for people to be their own bank and not have to be at the mercy of um, irresponsible governments um, and and you know uh, banks who who in, in the case of Argentina also have have the power to um, uh, stop you withdrawing your, your cash. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I I first had interest in crypto, and then after that, like just kept. Uh, track of what was happening in the space. Um, and so, like I said, when I was back in New York in 2017, I took the opportunity to um, to cover uh, crypto again. Um, and uh, much of what was driving the hype of 2017 was ICOs. So um, that's what led me to kind of learn uh, about Ethereum. And I saw that Wow, like Ethereum is really ambitious. It's trying to uh, be kind of the next step uh, in crypto after Bitcoin. Uh, like Bitcoin uh, was the first peer-to-peer -peer money, but Ethereum wants to be peer-to-peer -peer everything. Like because it is uh, programmable, um, it it really enables uh, developers to build whatever they want on top of 
on top of uh, this blockchain. So I thought that idea was incredibly interesting and um, and thought it was just, you know, pretty surprising that nobody had really written the history of Ethereum. So um, saw an opportunity there for me to be the first one to tell the story, uh, which to me at the time, I thought, you know, even if Ethereum um, fails, it still already changed the history yeah. of uh, blockchain, tech, mm -hmm. and finance uh, mm -hmm. with what it attempted to do and even what it had already done in 2017, which is fuel uh, this ICO mania, which, you know, like there's a lot to criticize there, but in its essence, it was the first time that people were able to um, uh, finance themselves, like startups were able to finance themselves in a decentralized way, uh, which is pretty re revolutionary. I think it's, um, I think I ICO got a really bad name, but it actually enabled something that's that's um, pretty radical, you know, uh, decentralized uh, fundraising. Um, so anyways, I, I just thought Ethereum really deserved to be uh, documented in a more uh, permanent way. And from there, you know, it was just, uh, I kind of really dove into learning the, the story, uh, talking to all the founders, like all the people involved in the early days, to all the developers uh, building on top of Ethereum. Um, I really tried to immerse myself in the community. So I, I went to all the different hackathons, uh, with all the different conferences, like really spent time with uh, the Ethereum community. And I realized that, you know, there is something real here. Like it's, it's not about like all the like um, hype and fluff of the 2017 days. Uh, during 2018 and 2019, I saw, okay, like these guys are building real applications like they are mm -hmm. en enabling actual kind of decentralized finance mm -hmm. um and so i thought you know there there's something um there's something that will make a real kind of lasting impact in the world here <clears throat> so that's that's why i i decided to then uh start the defiant because i thought um at the time there wasn't really anyone paying much attention to DeFi. Um, there weren't any uh, DeFi-focused newsletters. Um, mainstream uh, financial media wasn't covering it. And even crypto media wasn't covering it very much. Um, so again, I saw an opportunity there for for me to be kind of the, the one uh, leading the kind of coverage of, of the space. So I'm sure that's where the whole title, The Infinite Machine, came. You know, there was a really strong statement on one of your recent podcasts with Mark Cuban, which, by the way, guys, is a super duper. He's a legend. You know, I've been following him since season one of Shark Tank and so glad that he's joining the community as well. And he mentioned something that was quite strong, you know, that Ethereum has more potential or more value than Bitcoin. You know, obviously the Bitcoin maxis wouldn't completely agree on this kind of thing, but you did mention that Ethereum is giving infinite opportunities, right? It's creating, like you said, a new society, new infrastructure. Do you think that that statement was a bit far-fetched or do you agree with it in some ways? How did you feel about that? The statement that Ethereum has more potential than, than Bitcoin? I think it's really hard to say, but I definitely see see his point, and um, I I do tend to agree uh, with some caveats. Uh, to me, Bitcoin has huge potential. Um, I I do see it as uh, digital gold. Uh, I know that's a meme, but I think it it's I I believe in that. Like I I think Bitcoin because of its simplicity um, and because it's it's meant to be hard to change and it has these kind of set rules for how it works and it's not kind of moving or going anywhere. Um, I think it's it's really well suited to be the, the place where you uh, go and just, you know, park some of your savings um, to diversify, to protect against, um, you know, money printers and, you know, whatever. Um, so I think that's, that's a, that's a huge use case. Um, I, I do not believe Bitcoin is peer to peer money as it was, uh, initially intended to be. Um, uh, but I do believe it's uh, digital gold and, and that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. You know, it is yeah. providing uh, a vehicle for people to have uncensorable money. Um, 
And and so um, I think that's kind of the role for for Bitcoin uh, going forward. It's it's also kind of the the first gateway for uh, most people into crypto, um, and it will you know probably continue to be that. Um, uh, I think m- maybe Ethereum as it as it gains uh, popularity with all its different use cases will also kind of share that role uh, as kind of the main gateway for 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 mainstream. So it, it does uh, play a huge role. Um, so f- to me, it is kind of the gold of Web three, um, like the safe haven of Web three, um, which is really important. But um, uh, Ethereum is different. I mean, Ethereum was uh, built to be more flexible. Um, it was built to enable many other uh, use cases. Like it can be a store of value. Um, I mean, Ether is uh, kind of the base uh, currency of this new financial system being built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So it it can definitely be a a store of value, but Ethereum itself, the the platform and Ether as kind of the the fuel to these transactions um, is is enabling so many other uh, use cases besides being a store of value. So in that sense, I, I, I do agree with uh, with Mark that there, um, there, there is just like wider potential because there, there's so much more that can be built on Ethereum and that cannot be built on, on top of Bitcoin. So I think the, the new financial system, um, a more open um, and programmable financial system um, that is you know, that's here. I mean, it's not like a theory that may happen. It's actually here and like getting used and, and getting built. Um, that's going to happen on Ethereum and and not on Bitcoin. Those are some really, really good points. And I think you're right. You know, I try to explain to people that if Bitcoin is digital gold, if it's, you know, the future of a global reserve currency or a currency or commodity, it's still not financial services in its whole, right? Because Ethereum is more building the reinventing financial services, right? From everything, every single activity within it. So yeah, there's definitely great potential. And so if, by the way, if you guys think that Ethereum has more potential, don't forget to drop a comment in the comments box below. Some people may think that Ethereum and market cap may surpass Bitcoin one day. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Tell us why your input is critical. And uh, obviously, Camilla, you did an amazing interview with Mark Cuban. We'll put a link below. But I'd love to ask you, like, if you could tell us, you know, two or three of your favorite moments that you can recall. I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot through through the Defiant podcast and just sharing that information with us. That would be super cool. Yeah, the, the interview with Mark Cuban is definitely a highlight for for the podcast. I really enjoyed that uh, conversation. Um, to me, it was a really kind of a, a, a positive uh, surprise to see how um, how much he he actually knew uh, about DeFi and and NFTs. Like he was like really knowledgeable and had actually used all this stuff and like tested it himself. Like he wasn't just like speaking from like uh, other sources. He had actually like used all of these um, applications and was yield farming and using Aave and minting NFTs. So um, that that was that was super cool to see. Like the the interview with him and and like the fact that after actually testing all this stuff, he had come um, away with, you know, the conclusion that DeFi is the future, that NFTs is, you know, the, like, um, will revolutionize everything. Um, So it it just like his opinions carried that much more weight because he had actually kind of tested it and and, like tried uh, this stuff out. Um, It's, I, I think like uh, I, I I do like uh, one interview per week, so it's like, and I started this um, April last year, so it's been tons of uh, really interesting <laughs> conversations. Um, it's it's gonna be really hard to pick uh, yeah. three, but I think just like I I because like these are kind of the most recent conversations I'll have. I'll just like highlight the most recent um, podcast I I've, I've done. Um, so. And they're interesting because I really try to mix things up and and bring uh, more kind of mainstream interviewees yeah. um, or people from traditional finance 
to ask them what they think about DeFi. And I also bring in people who are very deep, deep in DeFi to get that kind of like a difference of perspectives and, and opinions. Um, so that was the case uh, with my interviewee last week. Um, I interviewed uh, People Pleaser, who is an artist um, that recently made waves in, in the Ethereum space because she made the animation for Uniswap V3, um, sold it as an NFT, uh, raised half a million bucks and gave it all away uh, for charity. No so she way. told kind of that story of like how she decided to do that and why. Um, and <clears throat> obviously like the topic of NFTs came up and like how she, th she sees NFTs will, um, uh, just empower artists and, and enable them to to monetize their their work in, in a better way. Um, then the the previous episode to that, I interviewed Jim Bianco, who is a, a, a researcher in for traditional markets, and he's kind of uh, been blown away by DeFi too. Um, same thing as with Mark, just like experimenting with these protocols and, and just like seeing how much better this new financial system is. Um, and then uh, before that, I, I interviewed Antonio Giuliano, the founder of DYDX, um, one of the biggest decentralized exchanges Amazing focusing exchange. on, on, on derivatives. Um, yeah. And so he was talking about like his latest move to layer two to improve scaling. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess like to, to summarize um, what I'm seeing from all these different perspectives, you know, like founders in Ethereum, um, artists using NFTs, uh, people from uh, mainstream uh, finance or, or traditional finance, I should say, um, and just, you know, startup uh, experts and like billionaires like, like Mark Cuban. Uh, they all come from very different perspectives yeah. and they are all finding uh, their own reason to really fall in love with this new Web3 world. And I think that's going to keep happening. I think people are going to come into DeFi and into Web3 and NFTs and find their own use case. Like maybe you're uh, some like crazy gambler and speculator and will love to be a yield farm ape. Um, maybe you're an artist who uh, will really find a utility in, in uh, selling your unique pieces directly to your audience. Um, maybe you're just a traditional finance dude who wants to diversify his portfolio. Like all of these things uh, can now happen uh, on uh, decentralized finance and, and on Web3. So I have a question. You were talking about ICOs earlier in 2017. And by the way, for those watching out there, ICOs have nothing wrong. It's the actors that make it bad. ICOs are actually the most decentralized way of fundraising that exists way better than having a room of VCs, you know, just buy the tokens and private sales and stuff like that. So, uh, but I, love, I have two questions for you, Camilla. Like, you know, ICOs was the bubble of 2017. Are NFTs becoming the bubble of 2021 because it's becoming a little bit far-fetched or overstretched or or do you think it's quite different from all the other bubbles we've had it's definitely different just the the token itself is is different i mean they are kind of unique pieces they're they're about kind of uh, linking some uh, property to a token like some uh i don't know digital art or a a, a, a music track or um uh a, a, like attendance or a ticket you know it's like the the token itself is very different from um, ERC twenty tokens linked to to a project. Like that can be seen a, a bit like like stock in a project. I know you're not supposed to say that, but that's yeah. <laughs> I think how people like really see them yeah. when they invest in in ERC twenty tokens. So the thing itself is just uh, fundamentally different. I mean, they're different things, uh, but there can still be um, a bubble in the sense that people might be uh, paying more for for nfts than than they will be worth in the future because maybe they're paying um uh, more right now because of there's just a, a lot of attention in this space so there's kind of this like premium attached to nfts yeah. like people are seeing so much potential um in 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 this new technology um that maybe like all those expectations are getting kind of 
ahead of themselves um, and are getting priced in now before they can actually fulfill all these use cases that people are seeing in them. Um, I think that was a, a bit of the case with the ICO boom. Like people were seeing um, all the potential that Ethereum and like blockchain technology would enable. Mm. But that wasn't the case at the time. Like it was just like a theory of like something that might happen in the future. Like you would buy promises on a white paper, but those promises weren't being delivered and they were being priced as if they were delivered. So I think that was kind of why the bubble happened. Like people were mm -hmm. like buying into this idea of like, oh, there's a new decentralized economy. But then like, you know, a few months later, you still had a white paper and no decentralized economy. And so prices uh, crash. Now, I think kind of the fundamentals that we, people were imagining and hoping for in 2017 have actually come true. Like all of like many of the projects who actually raised funds in 2017 are now like working products like yeah. um, Ave and MakerDAO. That's a really good point, Camilla, because, you know, obviously we had a DeFi bubble in 2020 summer where most of the projects lost, you know, between 70, 90 percent of their value. But as you mentioned, DYDX, for example, with layer two scaling solutions on Starkware and uh, lots of strong products are coming out of DeFi. So these type of corrections do make sense, you know, when there's a bit of an overhype in that sense. I have a really simple question, but it actually may be very difficult, Camilla. Sorry to throw you a curveball, mm -hmm. but since you have the defiant, how would you define DeFi? Because, you know, DeFi itself, you know, there, there are some projects that claim to be DeFi, but there are some projects in CeFi that are more transparent, more open, and actually sometimes, you know, just more accessible than DeFi is. So how, how would you how would you actually define DeFi? It's something that I've always asked myself, but very hard to answer. Yeah, I think DeFi, well, decentralized finance is first the ecosystem of financial applications being built on top of open blockchains uh, like Ethereum. Um, that's kind of like the high level. But I think like you you need certain requirements to actually be considered DeFi. Uh, I think first one is um, you need to be non-custodial. Uh, so that means um, users of these protocols should always be in control of their private keys. Uh, like you shouldn't be trusting a centralized entity to hold your assets. Um, so that's that's one part. So like in DeFi, your wallet is your identity and you uh, go with your one kind of Web3 wallet and use that to interact with all these different protocols. Like you, you shouldn't have to be, um, uh, you know, giving your funds to any one of these protocols, but it's, you know, they, they should be automatically connecting with your Web3 wallet. And that's kind of your way of, um, of using your, your money or your funds in, in these protocols. Um, the other requirement for me uh, is, um, is related is uh, the, the idea that these protocols should be open uh, to anyone. Uh, so they shouldn't be requiring KYC or requiring any sort of information to use them. Um, the only thing that should be required is an internet connection and a blockchain address yeah. um, to access. So non-custodial, open, and obviously kind of decentralized is like the <laughs> where the name comes from. I would love to hear your, your, your take on this, but I think inclusion is more important than decentralization. And, and even though I would like both, right, I want it to be decentralized and fully inclusive, it's not always the case, especially with the limitations of the technology we have as of today. And, uh, you know, when I see projects calling themselves DeFi, but they got fundraised by VCs, and then these VCs own all the tokens for all the governance, even if it's open source, even if it's non-custodial, even if it's without a KYC, that's not DeFi to me. Um, I'm sorry, I would prefer, I would go for a CeFi project over DeFi in that particular sense. Would love to hear your take on that. Is Are people using the branding to, to do some additional marketing, or is it just we're, we're still, you know, testing the, the world and trying to figure out how DeFi we can go. So uh, what's important there is you have the transparency of seeing the uh, token composition in DeFi applications. Uh, you can see like the percentage of tokens that are being held in how many wallets. Um, and you can also see um, the code itself, uh, how, you know, how uh, 
money is being spent and how um, what assets are held and um, and and there you see the difference between tether the stable coin and dai uh, where you know for, for tether uh, it was kind of years i think of of speculation about whether uh they were fully backed by usd or not and it took like a legal investigation for them to actually admit that they weren't uh fully backed by by actual dollars uh with dai on the other hand uh it's simply a matter of going to the smart contract going to the protocol which is open and verifiable and you can see exactly um how many um of the different cryptos, like how how much Ether, how much USDC, how much of the other collateral types are backing DAI. And, you know, that's just something that any, anyone can verify. Um, so in, in that sense, I think, you know, DeFi will always be uh, better than, than CeFi, at least in terms of, of transparency. And you can debate whether, you know, uh, some of these projects are more or less uh, you know, have better or worse at, at token uh, distributions, um, but at least you know they will be accessible to anyone. Like uh, yeah. uh, anyone can still access them, and if you want, like you you can buy like a large amount of like tokens um, if you have the money and become a whale too, or or at least like participate with however many tokens uh, you're you're able to buy, which is. It's different from most uh, CFI apps where you, you just have no no say at all, like no no matter how small. So it's not perfect. I, I think there there's a lot of work to do uh, in terms of you know how to uh, further decentralize governance. But I think it's certainly better than kind of the old old way. Yeah, exactly. And accessible to all to me, Camilla, is what really touches my heart. And by the way, guys, I have nothing against VCs funding projects. I just don't think it's DeFi. I think DeFi has to go through a fair and equal launch for all. And by the way, Uniswap has done things really well, as you're mentioning, Camilla. And I think actually Yearn Wi-Fi is probably the fairest uh, token launch of all time, right? Because there's no team tokens. There's no VC getting tokens. It's everyone at equal you know, at the equal grounds, you know, and the same start. And by the way, shout out to Nate for, for sharing that, because I think, yeah, you're in Wi-Fi is probably one of the realest DeFi projects out there. Um, what one, one more thing I want to ask you related to that, Camilla, is, you know, you mentioned KYC, right? And a lot of the DeFi geeks are super scared about decentralized exchanges being imposed KYC in the future, like regulatory mm -hmm. crackdowns. Is that your biggest fear? What is the, the biggest nightmare in terms of, is it the regulatory side that, that scares the DeFi people the most? Or what are some mm -hmm. things that, that kind of you, you're, you're not really looking forward to? I think, mm -hmm. yeah, like the regulatory question is certainly um, the, I think the biggest question mark. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think uncertainty it drives fear because you don't know, um, yeah. I mean, what, like how hard they, they might be, um, what they, what regulators may, um, may frown upon, what they might allow or not. Um, I, I think it's, it really hurts innovation and, um, and just, uh, growth of, of this industry. And, and it's really a shame. Um, I think, especially in, in the US, which drives uh, so much of, of just DeFi volume um, and and talent, like a lot of the, the teams are based here. Um, so I think it does put some um, limit to, to, some, to how fast uh, yeah. DeFi can go. And, and yeah. maybe, you know, teams are holding back on implementing certain things you know, obvious things like distributing uh, fees among token holders, because that will look more like securities, you know? So like, it's 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 definitely the case that DeFi teams are holding back on uh, really obvious things that their projects should be doing because of they are afraid of regulators. Um, and I think that that's, that's really a shame. I think that the US should be the, the home for for in innovation and and for like this new financial system um or it, it would just you know 
makes sense since so much is already coming uh, from here. Um, but, you know, if it isn't, I think it'll be inevitable that these projects will just move elsewhere. Like you, you just can't operate with uh, this much uh, regulatory uncertainty forever. Um, so I think it, there will come a point where uh, you these projects will start to hit a wall in terms of how much further they can grow in a space yeah. that's in, in a country that's not like offering just like regulatory clarity. Um, and when that time time comes, then it's really likely that, I don't know, development will start coming more from Asia, from Europe or places that are uh, friendlier. So yeah, I think that's that's probably kind of the, the, the biggest issue weighing on, on DeFi at the moment. Amazing. And uh, one last question, Camila. The, by the way, so far, this has been so much fun talking to you. You're, you have so many interesting <laughs> ideas. It's been absolutely lovely. But, you know, you mentioned MakerDAO, you mentioned Ave. Are they amongst your favorite DeFi projects at the moment? If there are others as well, can you tell us who which projects are you looking into and why for people who want to just, you know, learn more about DeFi, for instance? Okay, so I, I really don't like to kind of recommend or highlight specific projects because you know yeah. I, I I I I'm unbiased, unbiased. Uh, I'm a journalist in this yeah. space, but I can just mention like projects that I see objectively have a, a lot of traction, and so you can you can look at the projects with the most assets locked and with the vo most volume in, in DeFi, and also the ones who are just like shipping uh, so many new new products and 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 developments and so those are yeah like maker that continues to be kind of the one of the backbones of, of backbones. DeFi for sure yep. um Ave and compound are the the top lending uh, protocols um uniswap is uh, definitely kind of the the lead uh dex um but sushi swap has been a really kind of interesting uh, surprise that kind of came out of nowhere last year. Uh, they forked Uniswap, but now they've like what's been surprising is that they've actually grown into a legitimate uh, DEX in the space. Like they have now um, the the second uh, biggest volume um, after Uniswap. So people are actually using using this uh, this protocol. And with SushiSwap, there's this whole kind of urine finance ecosystem um, that's kind of like the second wave of DeFi, kind of like, I think a little bit challenging the, the mainstays, you know, like challenging the compounds and the Uniswaps. So you have like this second wave, like SushiSwap, Yearn, Cream is like the uh, fork of compound. Um, so I think that's kind of the interesting kind of newcomers, uh, like the interesting like projects to watch. Amazing. So in terms of favorite like asset classes, would it be fair to say that you like the yielding and lending? That's one of the most interesting asset classes amongst DeFi at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I think um, right now, like the biggest um, use case is, um, is using stable coins to gain yield in in different lending protocols and yield farming uh, protocols. Like I, I stay away from like the risky stuff. Like I don't like to think about like trading. I just like <laughs> yeah. put, put my stable coins in, uh, in a lending protocol and just like have it there earning yield. Um, I have some ETH and that's it. <laughs> um, but, but I think, I think um, that's, that's right now, like what DeFi is, is most useful for just uh, growing your savings, earning interest. Um, and, and then there's, you know, if, if you want to take more risk, there's the ability to um, borrow on collateral and, and like have kind of this leveraged uh, long uh, trades or, or trade on margin. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of like for the more um, experienced uh, trader. But yeah, I think uh, stable coins, lending, uh, earning like passive income is uh, a super important use case. Uh, more people can enjoy, the, not, not just like, the, 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 the crazy DJs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, and that's exactly what I tell everyone when they're like, is Bitcoin risky? I said, just start with a stable coin and earn yield and mm -hmm. then, you know, get to learn about the space in the meantime. Uh, and then, by the way, I agree also about derivatives. I think that's that's one of the grow fastest growing like DeFi spaces on top of that and with decentralized exchanges. So, uh, 
Camilla, I must say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And we're definitely going to have links of the Defiant, everything you're doing there. We'll put a link for the Infinite Machine as well for you guys to, to explore a little more. Um, Camilla is an amazing host on her show. Thank you so much, Camilla, for coming. And guys, if you like this show, don't forget to like, comment, and blast that bell notification so you get access to more of these timeless interviews with some of the best crypto educators in the space. Thank you so much for watching. Join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys. <laughs>